Hi, and thank you for joining our educational webinar on virtual urgent care visits at VCU Health, also known as telehealth. Dr. Danielle Gong and Dr. Romesh will walk through how virtual urgent visit works and when to use it. My name is Sharni Smith, and I'm a member of VCU Health's marketing team. So before we get started, I would like to first make note that we will hold all questions until the very end. So please feel free to drop any of those questions into the comments and we will address them during the Q&A. So first I'd like to introduce Dr. Gong. She is the Associate Medical Director for Telemedicine and an Emergency Medicine Physician at VCU Medical Center Critical Care. She completed her medical schooling at the University of Virginia and concluded an internship and a residency at Biden Medical Center. Next, I'll be introducing Dr. Ramesh, is a physician at Children's Hospital of Richmond at VCU, where he specializes in pediatric weight and healthy lifestyle management, along with general pediatrics. He completed medical school at the University of Virginia and a residency at VCU Medical Center. Thank you, Dr. Gong and Dr. Omesh for joining us today. And I will now turn the show over to you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, I am currently an emergency medicine physician and I am also uh, helping with the launching of our various telemedicine initiatives. And uh, next slide. So. As you guys have all probably experienced, because of the pandemic, a lot of routine medical care has become virtual in many uh, ways. What can you expect if you haven't had a routine medical um, doctor's office visit? You would expect a nice conversation about your current health in the comfort of your own home or workplace, and then a decision at the end of your visit on whether or not you need to actually be seen in person in relative urgency. As a result of the pandemic, we went ahead and launched something called virtual urgent care. So in virtual urgent care, you see a provider, usually a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant, and they can treat you for a variety of conditions, including allergies, asthma, colds, insect bites, rashes, etc. However, Basically, a lot of people have been using the virtual urgent care more like a reassurance or a screening, or they have a lot of questions about their medical state. And so we can also reassure a patient about whether or not they need to come to an emergency department or go to an urgent care or need a more urgent evaluation in person. Next slide, please. So to access VCU's urgent care, you can go to vcuhealthanywhere.org, which is the direct site, or you can go to vcuhealth.org and there will be links that will help direct you to our various telemedicine options. Uh, and here is, currently we have two virtual urgent care options. We have one for adults from 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. and one for children from 4 p.m. to midnight. Uh, we do not have 24-7 coverage at this time, but usually in the middle of the night, if you feel the need to see a doctor, we would recommend you probably just come into the ER at that point. Um, as a result of the variety of virtual visits that can happen, you'll find that we have found that a lot of people are actually having more complex questions that need answers that are not completely treatable by virtual urgent care. So we have about a 30% referral rate for in-person adult virtual urgent visits. That does not have anything to do with routine medical in, uh, visits, but Sometimes what we have found during the pandemic is that people need a lot of reassurance on coming into a healthcare facility, and that is what we are providing in addition to treatment options. So to access virtual visits, you need to have a computer or a mobile device or a tablet uh, with a working camera, speakers, microphone, so an iPad, uh, iPhone, an Android phone, a smartphone of any kind would work. You can use your laptop, which is also available, uh, has access to 
you know, a mic and a camera, as long as it has all of that. And you do need, if you're going to have video as part of the visit, you do need to have relatively strong Wi-Fi. Uh, we can do the visits by telephone and our virtual urgent care app allows loading of images. So if it is a skin condition or something that an image can show, you can load the image. And we have ha had that as that feature be used in conjunction with telephone in locations that have less good Wi-Fi. So it's not that you can't see a virtual urgent care provider if you are not in a great location with Wi-Fi. It's just that it is preferred. Next slide. And in addition to virtual urgent care, telehealth now also has a variety of what I would call extended continuum of care features. So we can do what's called rem remote patient monitoring. So we have diabetes clinics that can give you devices that allow your glucometer to be hooked up directly with a centralized database. And then a nurse monitors that database and alerts doctors if somebody's diabetes is you know, deteriorating or getting worse or just having some alarming numbers. And then the doctors or the nurses can check back in with the patient just to make sure that they are doing okay. And this has helped people identify early hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia, etc. We also now have devices to send home with patients after they've been hospitalized that will monitor their blood pressure, their heart rate, their temperatures, and send all of that information to a centralized system. And they also come with a video conferencing device so that the nurse and the provider can actually call more easily and locate the patient if something were alarming and they would need to find the patient. So we've actually used that in the pandemic. And so patients with high risks, risk factors that might decompensate if they get COVID-19 will get one of these devices to go home with and they will get frequent calls from our COVID-19 monitoring team. And this way it can kind of prevent any un uh, prevent any worsening of the disease by either bringing the patient in early or starting treatments early. So personally, I've really enjoyed having virtual care, um, virtual urgent care and virtual telemedicine capabilities. I myself have taken my kids to see the pediatrician virtually, and I also had my own virtual urgent uh, virtual visit for my own routine medical monitoring. I was able to give my vital signs because I'm a doctor, so I have all that stuff at home. And then my doctor was able to order all of my labs and such. So all I had to do was go to the laboratory to get all of my blood work done uh, beforehand. And so I just did that right before work. And then I was able to go home, um, have the visit at home, which was really convenient because then I didn't have to drive 25 minutes to see my doctor and then drive 25 minutes to come back home after my doctor's visit. So yeah, I, I thought it was rather nice. I have two young kids at home. So spending 25 minutes in the car, both directions with them is sometimes grueling. So, all right. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Ramesh Rajasuriya, and I am really excited to share a little bit uh, about our journey here within pediatrics with telehealth. Uh, just a little bit of a background. So uh, the, the, the Division of General Pediatrics has actually been doing telehealth visits for almost two years now, uh, but the numbers that we had been doing prior to COVID, the COVID chaos we now find ourselves in, uh, were much smaller. So we were, as an institution at VCU, uh, just to give you guys a little bit of history of, of telehealth here at VCU, as an institution, prior to COVID hitting in February and March, we were averaging about 100 to maybe 150 telehealth visits a week. The week after COVID sort of hit in 
all of its force, we jumped to close to 5,000 to 7,000 visits in that week. And then we have continued to see across the institution, this is not just within pediatrics, but across the institution, we've continued to see somewhere between 5,000 to 7,000 telehealth visits a week here. Um, so we really are undergoing, we have really undergone a revolution in how we deliver care uh, here at VCU to our patients. Um, our experience within pediatrics, and these are just um, a couple of numbers that I think are important to help us get our heads around uh, where, we've, where we are. So we currently, in the last five months, have seen more than 10,000 telehealth visits within our department. Within my division of general pediatrics, we've seen about 2,000 telehealth visits in the past five months alone. And one of the things I think it's important to point out here is how um, satisfied patients and providers have been with the telehealth experience. One of the main questions people have when they think about doing telehealth is, does it actually work and how well does it work? And so satisfaction scores are one way in which we can assess pretty quickly how, how well it's going. And so across the board, within pediatrics at least, patient satisfaction scores have been very high, 4.8. That's supposed to say 4.8 out of five, not 4.8 out of eight. And provider satisfaction scores have also been very high, 4.7 out of five. Uh, to date, as far as we know, no medical errors have been reported. Um, and very few of these visits have actually required the need for in-person visits. Um, there have been some. And when those are needed, we do have to move in that direction, but it's actually pretty rare. Um, next slide. So what kind of visits work well for telehealth? Um, while this is not an exhaustive list, I think it will allow you guys to sort of get your head around what kinds of things we see in pediatrics. And some of these things have parallel realities in the adult world. So. Um, I'm sure you can imagine what the equivalent would be in the adult world, but psychiatric visits and the our child psychiatrists have seen a ton of visits via telehealth during this period. Um, behavioral visits, uh, things like ADHD and school concerns are really, um, lend themselves really well to telehealth. And obviously as school is starting up just this week, uh, we are we are ramping up in the number of calls we're getting right now for people who want to see us to discuss school concerns via telehealth. Uh, rash and skin concerns are lend themselves really well to telehealth. Uh, acute illnesses when a patient is clinically stable are really, really, really good visits for telehealth. And so these could be anything from a fever to a cough to congestion. Uh, constipation is a common type of visit. If someone has had a, a cut on a part of their body and they, they don't think they need to go in to get stitches, but they want to see, hey, do I need to go get go in to get seen? Uh, telehealth provides a really easy uh, and efficient way to do that evaluation to determine if a further uh, further intervention is needed. We do a lot of lactation in pediatrics, and so um, these are for breastfeeding mothers, and lactation follow-up visits um, have been done frequently uh, via telehealth. Weight management is often done using telehealth and uh, works really well, and chronic conditions um, follow-up visits. And Dr. Gong was sort of alluding to this in her part of the presentation, things like diabetes, um, or asthma, or uh, hypertension. In the pediatric world, this would uh, this is often things like eczema, or seizure follow-ups, or cystic fibrosis follow-ups. So these conditions and these chronic conditions can very um, can be managed really well using telehealth without bringing people in and adding to their already busy lives. And then finally, we do we are increasingly doing follow-up visits for patients via telehealth. These are post-emergency department visits, uh, post-surgery visits, and even clinic follow-up visits. Um, next slide. So I just listed a bunch of different kinds of visits that work well for telehealth. There's obviously also certain types of uh, complaints and concerns that do not work well for telehealth visits. And, 
these are just a few. So when someone is actually in sort of a, um, a, a serious clinical condition or uh, exhibiting serious clinical symptoms, that should probably not be done via telehealth. A common one in pediatrics is an acute asthma exacerbation. Uh, if there's any significant pain of an organ system, um, then it probably is better to be seen in person. But if the pain is mild, uh, it can certainly, you can certainly start with a telehealth visit. Whenever we have acute neurological concerns or changes, uh, we suggest that that be seen in person. Uh, severe headaches should be seen in person. And then while vomiting or GI uh, illnesses can be seen via telehealth, if there's ever uh, bilious or green vomiting, that is something that needs to be seen in person definitively. Next slide. So thus far in this presentation, we've talked a lot about what works well and what doesn't work well for telehealth visits. And I wanted to quickly go over some of the benefits and barriers to telehealth. And so, you know, this is um, a list of reasons why the medical field believes telehealth uh, is beneficial and can often be superior to in-person visits, at least as a first line. So convenience, and Dr. Gong mentioned this when she was talking about her own experience, not having to spend 25 minutes uh, two ways to go in to see her doctor was really convenient. Uh, so there's no transportation time, there's no waiting room, room time. From the provider's side, it also allows us to see patients whenever is most convenient uh, for them, for them being the patient, and for us. And so a lot of providers have started seeing patients via telehealth in off hours or after sort of classic work hours. Obviously, there are challenges here. Uh, there are patients and populations, uh, patient populations that do not have robust internet access um, or sufficient, uh, sufficiently modern digital devices. Um, and then also there are challenges that we are experiencing for patients and providers who are less tech literate. Um, and so that is certainly a challenge that we are encountering in this world. There is the potential for significant cost savings um, as the overhead costs decrease with telehealth visits, you don't need um, all the clinic space and all the costs that go with clinic space because these can be done from a regular office or even from someone's home. Uh, and there's also a decrease in higher cost services that we are seeing across the country and at VCU. Uh, things like urgent care and ER visits actually cost a, a good bit of money to our system and to our insurance companies. And if those could be seen via telehealth, uh, it drops the cost pretty dramatically. There is a concern that there could be overuse of medical services because telehealth is so convenient that potentially patients uh, will access telehealth even when they don't really need to. Improved access, as you can imagine, uh, because we telehealth allows people to be seen uh, at different hours, different times, and we don't have the physical limitations of clinic space. Uh, we can see a whole lot more patients. Um, we have seen this, um, especially in the world of mental health during the COVID crisis, the ability for patients to be seen by psychiatrists and psychologists um, has dramatically increased because of telehealth during this period. And I think, at least in that world, that we will never go back because uh, as we all know, and I think as most of us are aware, access to mental health services in this country um, has been challenging to say the least and telehealth has provided a really important solution to that limitation. Um, a couple of other things, telehealth allows us to do multidisciplinary visits um, in, a, in a much more coordinated way. So we have numerous multi-specialty clinics like um, uh, like if someone has diabetes, they might be able to see their nutritionist, their psychologist, their doctor, uh, all at once in the same telehealth visit. Uh, and this, the different care providers don't necessarily need to all be in the same place because they can um, sort of zoom in, if you will, into the visit from wherever they are. We've also been able to do some provider to provider consults in new and efficient ways that we couldn't do when we were sort of stuck in the old way of thinking that you have to actually be in person. So 
what we're seeing is that doctors can actually see uh, a patient at another hospital where another doctor is, uh, and they can communicate about what actually needs to be done and maybe changes they can make to the management plan. As we're all aware in COVID, infection control is a huge, huge, huge benefit of telehealth. So because fewer patients are coming into our clinical buildings and into our hospital uh, and sitting in waiting rooms, it means that people are not coughing on each other as much or sneezing on each other as much. Uh, and therefore, we are, we are seeing that hospitals and clinics, which often are one of the places that uh, lead to the greatest spread of infectious disease are becoming actually much less that way. Um, and then, yeah, the telehealth has provided another way of triaging rapidly patients um, along or across the spectrum, like who needs to be seen immediately in person and who can actually be managed uh, using a modality like telehealth. Next slide. So Dr. Gong sort of walked through the way of visit uh, in the urgent care setting or the emergency room works. I wanted to quickly walk through how a scheduled telehealth visit in a clinic would work. So basically um, what would happen with the visits we do in our clinical spaces and our outpatient clinics is that an appointment is made uh, using a with a scheduler, the same way you would make an in-person appointment but you make it as a telehealth visit. And then about 20 minutes prior to the scheduled appointment, a nurse or a front desk staff would contact the patient via phone, gather the normal history that might be gathered before you see your provider, ensure that if there is any updates to be made on the medication list or the weight or the height or any of those things that those are done and completed, and then the nurse walks the patient through how to set themselves up on the telehealth platform. Um, we use um, a, number, a couple of different platforms here at VCU, but Zoom is one of the ones that we use most frequently in pediatrics. And so for us, the nurse would then send the patient or the parent a link, a Zoom link, so that they can then check into the visit. So from the provider end, when the provider is ready to see the patient, uh, the patient is now in the waiting room in Zoom, and the provider would admit the patient into the clinic room. This is all virtual and would start conducting the visit, uh, gathering history either uh, verbally. A lot of times we can gather information prior to the visit by the portal or even an email that, can, um, that might go between the patient and the provider before the visit. And then pictures. So while the video feed is helpful, sometimes uh, the video may not provide the detail we need if we're looking at a rash, for example. And so pictures can actually be sent in beforehand or during the visit in order to allow the provider to more clearly see whatever, um, whatever needs to be seen. Next slide. Then the exam. So the provider would then, after gathering the history, conduct the exam as he or she would do if it was an in-person visit. Uh, while the exam is not ex not the same uh, and you can't sort of do as thorough an exam as you would be able to do if you were in person, you can do a lot just by observation. Um, and I have experienced this firsthand. There is a lot of information I can gather by looking at the patient. Um, I also often get the parent or the patient to help with parts of the exam. So I can ask how the, if the abdomen feels soft, and then I can ask the patient to sort of push on his or her abdomen or ask the parent to push on his or her abdomen to see if there is any pain or tenderness. Um, there, you can look at some parts of the body that maybe are more difficult to see by having the parents shine, shine a light, for example, into the child's mouth in order for me to be able to see the posterior throat for kids who may be um, uh, were concerned for something like strep throat. And then once the exam is completed, um, the assessment and plan, the provider completes the assessment and plan, discusses what he or she thinks with the patient and comes up with what the next steps would be. And when the visit is completed, uh, the provider would send the plan to the patient and the family via the portal and any additional educational materials uh, that could be helpful. If there are prescriptions needed, those can be sent to the pharmacy electronically through the EMR. Uh, and then the office staff 
uh, once can call the patient to set up any follow-up visits if needed. Next slide. So that's a quick run through of sort of what kinds of visits work well, what are the benefits and the barriers, and how does a visit actually work? And I just wanted to quickly go over a lot, uh, some of the common questions and concerns that arise about telehealth. So one of the questions I often get is, can a provider accurately assess a patient over a video? Um, and like I showed you at the beginning of my presentation, we have now done over 10,000 visits just within pediatrics and probably over 60,000 visits at this institution. Um, and I think uh, we feel pretty confident that we can assess what we need to over a video. And if we can't, we would just switch that visit into an in-person visit. And so it's not that complicated to switch that over. Um, what happens if that is needed? What happens if we do need to switch a child over to an in-person visit? Um, we would just let the patient know, hey, someone's gonna call you right after I get off and we'll, we'll set up an appointment for today or tomorrow in order for you to be seen in person. Um, if, if the assessment by the provider is that the patient actually needs to be seen urgently, then we would tell the patient, hey, we're gonna get off and you need to come into the ER. And that, that is what would need to happen. Um, as I mentioned in the sort of uh, format of how a visit occurs, if there are prescriptions needed, those are just sent. You know, now with the MR, we no longer need to hand out prescriptions. In fact, we cannot hand out prescriptions. And so we just send the prescriptions to the pharmacy of your choice after the visit so that you can then go over there and pick up whatever is needed. Um, if the internet connection is bad or does not work, which does happen, but not as often as you might assume, um, but it does happen, we sometimes have to switch over from a video visit to just a phone visit, which is not ideal, but often is doable and we can still get the information we need using just a telephone um, visit. If a patient is not satisfied with the telehealth visit, again, it is important to realize we will switch it over. We will do what we need to do in order to get you seen in person, uh, either the same day or the next day. Um, so it is not the end of the story that, oh, this is a telehealth visit and this is all your only option. Uh, there will always be the option of if you're not satisfied with the assessment done there that we can find another way to see you. Uh, and this last question is one that keeps coming up and has actually been a moving target through COVID. So does insurance cover telehealth visits? Um, currently, most insurance companies are covering telehealth visits. Uh, however, there is, as we come out of sort of the COVID crisis, even though COVID is still very present with us, um, as we are in sort of not in the crisis mode, insurance companies are adjusting their policies around this. And so, uh, there will be no copay chart. Um, you will not be asked to pay a copay at VCU for a telehealth visit. But if the insurance company does bill, um, to send in a bill, that will come directly to you for your telehealth visit. So, next slide. So, I think that is most everything. So, I'll open, uh, Dr. Gong and I would love to open the floor to any other questions that might arise. Yeah, of course. Thank you both. This was definitely an informational presentation. And so I'll start off with our first question. Is there an additional cost to using telehealth and will my insurance cover the cost? And I know Dr. Ramesh, you just kind of touched on that. Um, but I think if we could kind of elaborate on if there is a copay for an urgent care visit through telehealth um, versus scheduled and kind of uh, differentiate what those two um, would be. So there is no current copay for any type of telehealth visit, virtual urgent care or scheduled at this time. If you are a VCU employee, our health insurance will eventually lead to you receiving a $5 bill. Yeah, um, yeah and so part of this, you know, so prior to COVID hitting, um, there was a wide spectrum of what insurance companies were doing with telehealth visits. Um, a number of them were covering it as though uh, the same way they would cover an in-person visit. Uh, there were some that were had different uh, charges for telehealth versus in-person. Uh, during COVID, 
basically all the insurance companies across this country, basic because they realized that telehealth was one of the key solutions to uh, decreasing infection spread, said, hey, we're going to waive all, all fees and all costs. And now as we're coming out of the crisis, some of them are going back or trying to restructure what their telehealth uh, coverage will be. My sense, and I think the people who live in telehealth, uh, we believe that uh, most insurance companies are going to basically cover telehealth in the same way that they cover in-person moving forward. Um, some insurance companies are still on that journey and figuring that out, but I think that's where we're probably going to land. Okay, perfect. And the next question is kind of along the lines of that as well is, can you explain why the cost of telehealth is the same as a regular visit, even though I'm not physically meeting with a provider? So I believe um, this also kind of touches on whether there is a copay or not, or also um, what your insurance will cover um, and, and why that cost is, is right, the same. Yeah, um, I'll give my, my view on that. It's a great question. Uh, so this is, you're getting into the business side of medicine and all the negotiations that are going back and forth. Um, so because we did not have robust systems prior to COVID, the quickest way to sort of um, pivot was to just make it the same. And I think as we move into a long-term solution around telehealth, that part of which will be about COVID, but a lot of which will be about just improving access to healthcare across this country. I think there will probably be some reworking of how much telehealth visits will cost versus um, in-person visits. Uh, from a provider standpoint, it takes us probably about the same amount of time to do one versus the other. But from a system standpoint, there certainly are different costs that are not accrued or um, with a telehealth visit versus a in-person visit. On the flip side, the overhead cost for telehealth is the fact that you do have to have a platform. Um, and there is a cost to, main, to both developing and maintaining a platform that, that is an overhead cost to telehealth visits that is not present um, in in-person visits. And I can say from a virtual urgent care perspective, the urgent care visit is going to be less than the emergency department visit cost. And if you use our virtual urgent care services, you will see a emergency room provider to screen you for emergencies first and then treat you for your urgent care needs. And in many, that is that will cost the patient less than just if, if they can be seen virtually versus coming into the ER, walking in through the front door of the ER. Okay. Great. Um, and another question we have, and I know Dr. Amesh, you touched on this as well, but can I get a prescription after a telehealth visit or is this only through in-person visits? You can certainly get a prescription if the provider uh, is pretty certain of the diagnosis and that the diagnosis requires a prescription, um, we will send prescriptions. There will be, there there may be some diagnoses like in pediatrics, one of the common ones is we're a little bit more hesitant to diagnose an ear infection um, just via virtual visit, just because we can't see the ear. And so we might say, hey, we need to actually bring you in to see that before we send a prescription. But that's up to the provider and how and how confident they feel based on their history and the parts of the exam that they can do as to whether or not they can uh, comfortably diagnose whatever the condition is and then send the appropriate prescriptions. So uh, one of the things that I think uh, we have been really excited about is that there is some data suggesting that telehealth visits leads to over prescription uh, relative to in-person visits because people Providers can tend to be a little bit more um, careful. They, they don't want to miss something. But it, at least uh, in pediatrics, we have not seen a overprescription issue when we compare our telehealth visits with our in-person visits. Great. And another question we have is, how can I make a telehealth appointment at VCU Health? So, Depending on what specialty you want to see, you can either, you could, if, you're, if it's an urgent need, you can just 
go to vcuhealthanywhere.org, sign in. You have to have an email address. That's the one thing you do need to have is an email address. And then you ha- you can input all of your information and you will see a screen that says, please wait for your provider. And if it's you, then you'll see an adult provider. And if it's your child, then you will see a pediatric provider, depending on which system you use. If you want to make a telehealth appointment with us, another provider, say Dr. Ramesh, then you can go to the same web, uh, go to a website, vcuhealth.org, and then there will be a request an appointment link area. And you can either call the phone number or use the form. And then our appointment center will get in touch with you to schedule your telehealth appointment. Depending on which specialty, sometimes if you're a new patient, they will urge an in-person visit for a new patient. However, if you request it to be a telehealth appointment, they can usually accommodate that request and you can first see the provider via telehealth. I did this for my own personal dermatology appointment the other day. So, Perfect. Mm -hmm. Um, And our next question is, how secure is the connection for a telehealth visit? I have concerns about discussing and showing sensitive health information over a video platform. So our virtual urgent care platform is very secure. Um, All of our platforms have gone through security analysis and have been deemed appropriately secure. We have taken a somewhat conservative approach to certain chief, certain presentations. So if you are concerned about a skin condition in somewhat private area, we may request that you come in person and not just show it to us on over the internet, just to be extra safe. Um, that has definitely happened. People have, you know, come in, they, they've they called, they've talked about a various infection on their breast or, you know, somewhere that we were like, eh, if it's in that sensitive area, then you should probably be evaluated in person. So if it's a, it's a concerning physical examination, then we'll request that you come in Usually, people who are concerned about sharing sensitive information over a video platform probably will not use a telehealth service to do that particular encounter. So they might have an encounter that they are willing to talk about their asthma management or their diabetes management, but other issues they will request an in-person evaluation. And like Dr. Ramesh said, you always have the option to choose one or the other. Yeah, I think um, I just want to reiterate what Dr. Gong said. These the platforms we're utilizing here at VCU um, have passed HIPAA compliance regulations. Uh, those HIPAA compliant regulations far are far exceed any regulations that oversee, uh, for example, the banking industry where we transfer money freely <laughs> for, for most of us. Um, and so it is. It is not, I'm sure there are people that can hack things uh, across the world on just because of the way the internet works, but these are highly, highly secured platforms. Um, And in some ways, uh, when you talk to people in the security world around these platforms, they will say that you're actually probably more secure on one of these HIPAA compliant platforms than you are even in person from a who could walk, like there's a more chance of someone walking into a room in person than there is of someone being able to break through the barriers that are the security barriers that are created uh, in our virtual like telehealth world. Um, there's a related question here, I believe. Well, I'll let Trinice get to the related question. Oh yeah. Um, so are telehealth sessions recorded? And so I think for this question, um, they're looking for is it recorded for your patient portal or recorded for um, for you to have on record if there needs to be any follow ups? Uh, so this is a, one of the HIPAA rules: is you cannot record patient encounters. So that's in person or so as a provider in any way, shape, or form, the medical system is not allowed to record the patient encounters. Um, If a patient decides, and so we can't record telehealth sessions, we do not, um, we're we're not allowed to. It's it's not legal. Yeah, we can't record any type of in-person encounter. So we can't have recordings of 
telehealth visits. If you show up to the ER, you, your visit is not recorded. You might see security cameras, but your visit is not recorded, okay. regardless of what modality you're using to see a doctor. Right. It's definitely good to know. Um, well, thank you, Dr. Gong and Dr. Amash. It was such a pleasure having both of you join us for this educational webinar. And telehealth is such a great option for patients to visit with a healthcare provider for minor emergencies or for follow-up appointments that are not life-threatening. Um, so to learn more about telehealth um, or to visit patient, um, sorry, to visit physician profiles, visit vchealth.org. And once again, thank you both for speaking with us today. And to all who joined us, have a good night. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you.